Well, it's 6.30, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, people might be still coming in, uh, but I wanted just to make sure to respect uh, my time um, as I am the uh, only one here at, uh, right now. So um, hopefully that you guys could all hear me okay. Uh, I know last time we had a live session, we had some technical difficulties um, as far as not hearing the recording. Um, so just want to make sure um, that hopefully you guys can hear it. Um, so yeah, anyways, uh, this is tonight's agenda. We will have, I'll introduce myself as most of you guys know who I am, but um, be good to introduce um, myself and some of you guys. Um, uh, live classroom expectations, important reminders, uh, checking in. Uh, we'll talk about the course project lesson plan part four, um, the learning styles and teaching strategies, uh, chapter eight case study, um, and then um, uh, if anyone does come on um, online, we have time for questions and answers. Uh, if, our, if you are reviewing this recording, uh, you guys can uh, feel free to uh, ask any questions that you might have about the live session tonight. So, um, so as we get started, um, as all of you guys know, um, my name is Mike, and I am I uh, live in Colorado. I'm an education supervisor for a Head Start program in Denver Metro. Um, I also am a professional um, specialist. I'm a, a professional specialist for the CDA program through the Council of Recognition. Um, so I kind of do three different things in the early childhood sector. Um, and then uh, my favorite children's book and why um, uh, it changes from time to time. Right now, my current one is Sleepy Squirrel. It's about a book from the 80s about a squirrel getting ready for bed who insists she's not asleep. I like this book and I read it to my daughter every night because it kind of reminds me of her. She uh, she likes it too. Um, she always insists that she's not sleepy, and then she ends up falling asleep on me <laughs> as I read her a book. So um, if you are viewing this recording, um, please uh, make sure that you answer these questions, uh, your favorite children's book, and where you reside, and why uh, to earn full credit uh, in discussion format, in paragraph format. So as you guys all know, um, if you are attending a live session, you're expected to engage with myself and your uh, fellow students about the course concepts. Uh, the purpose of these live sessions is for open dialogue and questions are encouraged. Um, I do, um, some of the, the feedback from the mid survey is to have more live sessions. Um, unfortunately, this class is only offered two live sessions uh, for the um, term. So, um, yeah, it would be good to have more live sessions, but um, also it, sometimes the, the college structures these to um, only have two because uh, I think, you know, for this, this is a field experience class. Um, so, anyway, uh, you know, but when the purpose of the live sessions for open dialogue and questions, um, because a lot of times we cannot connect um, uh, through live audio. Um, so basically um, what I do is if you cannot make it, you will be the next day. Um, I will put it on the next day. And then you would complete a live session quiz to earn the credit um, and then answer the questions that I asked the class during the presentation in order to receive full credit. Hi, Kayla.
moving on um, to important reminders. Um, as a lot of you guys know that the last day of class is approaching us pretty quickly. Um, it is Friday, March 20th. Uh, no assignments will be accepted after 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time for any reason. The Module 5 discussion responses are due on Saturday, um, March 14th. And then the course project uh, lesson plan part four is due Sunday, March 15th. So that's the Sunday coming up. Um, and then the module five experience report is also due March 15th as well. Um, all field experience hours should be completed and you must have at least 30 hours of field experience or you will not pass the class. So if you're having trouble trying to complete it, um, hopefully you've reached out to me prior to this, um, but I think that most of you, if not all of you, are in good shape. Um, module 6 discussion is due Friday the 20th. There are no responses to peers or myself that are required. And then the module 6 field experience report um, is also due on Friday, March 20th. Kayla, hello, Kayla. Do you have any questions regarding uh, important reminders? Do you have any questions regarding important reminders? So it looks like Kayla can't hear me. Um, so that means if Kayla can't hear me, I'm guessing many of you guys can't hear me. Uh, we also had the same issue last time. Um, there is something going on with WebEx where it is difficult for students to actually hear um, the actual live, live session. Uh, so bear with me, um, I may have to also post. Can you hear me now, Kayla? Okay, never mind, <laughs> Kayla could hear me, so I think we are in good shape. Okay, uh, Kayla, do you have any questions uh, regarding um, important reminders? Perfect. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, moving on forward, just checking in. Um, if you are reviewing this online, please answer these questions. Um, how are things going as we are near the end of the term and what, what are your reactions to the module four? Uh, some of the key takeaways that you've learned um, are you guys reading the announcements each week and are you able to view my feedback on assignments? Um, and then as of now, do you know your grade in the class? A um, couple of things just to wanted to see how you guys are doing and wanted to check in. Um, since Kayla, you are online, um, how are things going so far? Feel free to use your audio, Kate, Kayla. It's just me and you. I promise I'm not scary. Yeah, I think it's really good. Um, I've been able to balance home life and school pretty well. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty easy class since it's field experience. It's um a lot of just observation and pretty much your takeaways of what you're learning during them.
Do you know your grade right now? Yes, I do. I currently have an A. Oh, good. Then, uh, uh, and then you're obviously reading the announcements each week because you do have an A. <laughs> um, uh, do you have any reactions from last week's module at all? Um, um not really. I mean, just as in, um, It was just more like additional notes and review from the previous class that I had, kind of on like the child development and stuff like that. But I really enjoyed doing the lesson plan section because then I got to think out of the box of how to connect to the community, but also still stick with the lesson. So sure. Great. Well, that's awesome. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Um, you know, since it's just me and you, Kayla, tonight, it's gonna go quick. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, uh, basically, um, thanks for checking in. Uh, if you are reviewing this online, please make sure to answer these questions. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the course project, the lesson plan part four that is due. Um, this is do this week. So um, yeah, I just wanted to take a minute to go a few minutes just to go over it. So you guys will be completing uh, your lesson plan that you have been working on all term. So what you want to do is you want to open up your module four comprehensive lesson plan assignment, uh, which should already include the components from module two, three and four lesson plan assignments. You want to begin by going through the feedback that I left you on your previous course project assignments and then making corrections and additions where necessary. Uh, you could always uh, view my feedback on the previous assignments by clicking on the My Grades tab on the left side menu of the course homepage and then clicking on the assignment. Uh, there you can view my text notes by scrolling over the highlighted areas. You can also see additional notes by clicking on the rubric. And then once you have made the necessary corrections, you can open the module five comprehensive lesson plan template, copy and paste the entire module five template onto the bottom of your revised module four comprehensive lesson plan. Um, and then complete the module five template and submit the assignment as one document. Uh, the biggest thing is one document. Um, I know I have had other students um, in the past submit several documents. Yeah, just make sure it's all just one document. Um, and then obviously for uh, additional support, you can use uh, support on how to copy and paste to create one lesson plan. You can view the short video available. Um, in the instruction uh, for the assignment. Um, and then if you guys are having any problems as you complete this week's assignment, feel free, feel free to reach out to me uh, via email, via text. Um, sometimes if I might not be on my computer, uh, it might be easier to reach on via text. So whatever works better for your schedule. Kayla, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, when I was in safety, I did end up like backspacing and deleting some of the dead space onto it, so it combined each of the modules together a little better, so it just wasn't 10 pages by the time that I was done filling everything out. That's good feedback to know. Um, awesome. Thanks for sharing. Um, so yeah, if you guys have questions about that, please reach out um, and then, uh, you know, uh, what Kayla just said, if you guys encounter what she has encountered with the backspacing, um, just try to do that. Um, and if you have questions, just reach out. Uh, learning styles. Um, so last week in chapter six, you guys were supposed to read about different learning styles and teaching strategies. Uh, diff basically, learning styles are how individuals perceive and process information. Um, with that being said, there are three channels most 
frequently used by individuals to take information. Um, there are more, but um, the main three are seeing, hearing, and touching. Um, basically, individuals who learn best by seeing are classified as visual learners. Um, and then uh, people or children who learn best are usually classified um, as auditory learners. And then those who learn best by touching is covered, um, is classified as kinesthetic learners. Uh, I, for example, learn best by doing. I have to actually touch and see it and do it. Um, I also, I, I, you know, I probably use seeing and touching um, simultaneously um, as my strong points. Um, I'm a little bit more better of actually with the hands and actually doing it. Um, but you know, like my wife, on the other hand, she's more of an auditory learner. Uh, she learns best by hearing. She asks a lot of questions and she also is great into attention to detail, um, which I am not. So that's not how I learn. Um, you know, with having those three different um, avenues of learning styles, how do you learn best and what's your reason for that? Um, and then what strategies do you use to promote children's learning in the classroom? And I'm guessing that you use, everyone uses probably similar stuff. Um, so if you are viewing this online, please answer these questions. How do you learn? Um, and what strategies do you use to promote um, children's learning? So I shared a little bit. I learn more by doing. Kayla, how do you learn? I learn more on the different I if you talk, I can listen, but then also have to write notes to visually um, see what you're saying. So mm. that's more of me. But I don't really need to be hands on with anything to understand. I'm more of a stand to the side, observe and listen to understand exactly what I'll be doing before I actually jump in. Nice. I don't know. It seems like a lot of a lot of women, not just a lot of women, but most women, a lot of women I know, like to have the uh, visual and hearing. Um, me, on the other hand, I, it's, it's just weird. It's like men, they usually use their hands. Um, I don't know if it's a male, female differentiates or preference or what, but um, I don't know if you guys notice that either in your classroom with, um, say, the boys and girls in your classroom. Um, so yeah, just, you know, with that being said, what strategies do you guys use to promote learning? Um, I know in my classrooms, when I was uh, a teacher back, way back in the day, um, I used, you know, Sing and dance uh, uh, with songs. I mean, there's just so much that you could do. Um, writing stuff on a board, writing things down, having the children um, do it themselves. Um, you guys probably do that, um, but maybe didn't understand that these are the different learning styles. Um, so can you just share a little bit um, what strategies you use, Kayla, in your classroom? Promote learning. We usually have the lead teacher present it and describe it and then pass it around to all the students and touch it and ask questions. But then we'll put the material back on the shelf. So then when the activity centers are open, they can go on their own terms and play with it, ask questions and still interact with it without having to take up so much time during circle time for them to get a full understanding of the theme. Nice. Yeah, um, you covered that nicely. So, um, do you uh, use, um, have you guys ever used like finger puppets at all? I don't know, I can't remember which age you work with. Um, that's something that I've been trying to use. Um, sometimes I come into the teacher's classroom and use finger puppets. Um, and it seems like the children really, really take to that. 
Yeah, but in the teal room, they actually use socks, like actual socks, as like sock puppets. So um, it it gets them to use their creativity, so then they can use other materials to still learn the concept, the toy and interaction, without actually having the material of the Sure, sure. Great. Awesome. So yeah, if you're viewing this online, please make sure you answer these questions. Um, thanks, Kara, Kayla, for sharing. Um, you know, if there was more people in here, more people could actually share. Um, but since it's me and you, um, I'm going to keep jumping on to the next slide. Um, do you have anything else to add, Kayla? No. Perfect. Um, um, so connecting with families, um, basically this week is about um, connecting with families. I know your discussion has something that revolves around that. Um, by the way, yes, your initial discussion is due tonight at 11.59 Central Standard Time, um, just so you guys know. Um, so connecting with families and communities. Um, so basically in chapter eight there is a case study and there's a lot of good information regarding collaborating with families and communities uh, from community outreach to parent teacher conferences uh, collaborating with school districts uh, transition into kindergarten parent night volunteering uh, different um, dynamics of family dynamics um, there's just a lot of information, um, but one of the things that we need to know um, is that we are the parents, uh, the parents are the child's first teachers, and they are responsible for what the child, um, what their children know upon entering school. Um, you know, if teachers, and I was telling my teachers, it is, um, we need to be really be sensitive to families, um, especially that don't attend a different school functions. Um, a lot of them do it just because of different reasons. Um, but I'm going to read. Uh, you didn't have a chance. Have you had a chance, Kayla, to read the um, being a teen mother and being sing single? No, I haven't. Okay, I, I'm just going to read it just because I know if you haven't read it, I'm sure a lot of the class hasn't read it. And I'm going to read it and just um, then we could just debrief real quick with it um, with the questions that are on the bottom. Um, so uh, it says being a teen mother and being single. Um, as I reflect and move forward, there is no doubt that I was a troubled teen upon graduation from high school. I found out I was pregnant and what were my options? What would life hold for me and my child? As a young indigenous working class woman, I'd become another casualty of societal inequities, or would my position or my child to follow a path of poverty and disempowerment? Uh, yes, I had a loving family, and yes, I had a personal drive, but I didn't have wealth, racial, or gender privilege. Because of my perseverance and familial love, I entered an urban community college. There I met a faculty mentor who helped me empower myself. Uh, without his belief in me, I may not have been able to believe in myself. My daughter was born at the end of my first year. I was worried about how I could continue school and care for my newborn. My mentor encouraged me to bring her to school when my family was unable to help. Uh, he would watch her in her office when I attended class as I had an academic home. Not all of my experiences were positive, but because I was a teenage mom, I was often talked down to, expected to do poorly academically, and was assumed that I provided inadequate care for my child. For example, I was strongly encouraged by the college to attend parenting classes. Although I learned valuable information about the importance of play and had a wonderful opportunity to learn new songs and games with my child, I also was positioned as the teenage mother or the at-risk parent. These educators failed to understand that my lived experiences gave me an incredible life tool. 
I was raised by a hardworking single mother and a loving family. My parental funds of knowledge came from a loving community that cherished each child as a sacred gift. We may have not always been lavish with extravagant gifts, but we were always immense in love. Um, in reflecting back, I realized how much I believe in the power of fierce hopefulness through mentorship and love. For me, the stereotypical portrayals of teen moms and social inequities were what could have been my roadblocks. Um, I urge all my teach I urge teachers and caregivers to examine their biases about teen moms and the social issues that impact the lives of young mothers. Every mom, as well as every child, deserves empowering spaces that they can succeed. Uh, now, just having read that and um thinking and reflecting about that what are your thoughts regarding the case study and what does your program do to connect with families and communities um for me um in any situation um we can get really quick to um judge someone about who they are or you know what the situation that they're in. Um, but in all reality, we don't really know what they're really going through. Um, and sometimes, you know, we just see bits and pieces of it. But as human nature, we do tend to have biases because we are not, we are imperfect beings. Um, that's just part of our nature. Um, but you know, thinking in the back of your mind when you see maybe, uh, you know, for us with Head Start, we sometimes have homeless people. Um, instead of, well, why did you get yourself in that situation in the first place? You know, maybe thinking you're changing, you're thinking of uh, how can I, what can I do to help you best better your life and support your child? Um, sometimes it's hard in that way. Um, Especially if, you know, if you have a family of yourself and you're a hardworking person and you see this and you just wonder, well, what are they struggling uh, about? And um, for me, uh, I used to live in North Dakota, which there is not a lot of homeless people there. There's just not a lot of people there in general. Um, when I moved to the city, um, you get to see a lot more homeless people. You get to see a lot more diverse. Diversity, you can see a lot more needs. Um, and it really put a perspective on myself that, man, you know, I had a really good upbringing comparing to possibly some of these people and some of these kids that are on the street. Um, and that's what really made me go into teaching is, is helping these families be get in a better situation. Of course, yes, sometimes they have to help themselves, but you know, as educators, we need to really mentor them and support them with what they need. But, you know, I, you know, they do have to meet us halfway too. Um, but I think giving them the, all the opportunities and um, compassion is really big of helping um, connect with families and having that relationship and establishing them so they can become um, successful in life. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm rambling on Kayla. Uh, uh, so yeah, connecting with families and communities. What are your thoughts regarding the case study? How does your program connect with families? Hello. Sorry, I'm trying to mute it. Um, I think in general, life is hard. It doesn't matter if you have a dog or five kids, you live at home, you live on your own. I don't think anybody is in a position to tell someone how their life is or how it should be. Um, I always encourage people to better themselves, no matter what their circumstances are, and if they need assistance, I applaud them for reaching out rather than keeping it a secret. Because if you keep it a secret, then you're just hindering yourself and then you're making the stereotypes come true towards your life places. 
but mm -hmm. I don't think that any person to look down on her should be proud of themselves because that mentor just stepped up beyond their job title or requirement to make sure that she had the support that she needed. And that's amazing because it's really hard, like you said, for people to try to break out of that mold of thinking, even though that's what we should be doing as a community is to build each other up. But sometimes people tend to get caught up in their own minds and start putting people down rather than treating people how they would like to be treated. Sure, yeah. Um, and then the program that I'm in, they actually accept donations. So if, for instance, my two daughters, they all prefer clothes, I feel like every day. So I bring in bags of clothes and then they distribute it to other families who attend the program that have mentioned that they might be struggling or just a little assistance, but they really don't know how to ask for it. So we just kind of leave clothes out in certain classrooms with the ages that are appropriate so the families are able to pick and choose what they would like without having to openly admit that they need clothing. And that's great. That's great uh, ways that your program um, connects with uh, the communities and the families and donations really do help um, with a lot of programs, especially with programs that don't have a lot of funding. Um, that's a really good positive way to um, connect with families and communities. Um, another thing that we do, um, Kayla on our end and I, Aisha, um, we uh, have uh, different programs like different parenting programs um, that teaches parents how to deal with um, social emotional um, the social emotional aspect of children's domains. Um, we got a really big grant where we have all staff that is um, trained in it. Um, it's a two-year program, so um, we do that. And then some of our teachers actually become trainers, which is pretty cool, but it really helps the parents and they learn a lot. Um, regarding how to handle different behaviors for their children, especially with children that have um, special needs and have some behavioral struggles um, or trauma. Uh, that's another big thing that happens in um, the line of work that I work at is um, we do have some children who have trauma just because of different life circumstances. Um, we also have different things like parent, um, parent, uh, we call it parent meetings, where we have different topics each month where parents can come in and get this educated on different things um, and different resources to the community. Um, and, you know, if they're having problems trying to make it to the program, we will offer them lift services um, so they could get back on their feet so that their child could be in school. Um, we really, really do different things in our program just to really connect with the family, the community. Um, we host this huge literacy event for the whole county um, where we have three to 500 people there uh, where kids come home with at least one or two books. Uh, all the families get fed. There's prizes, there's raffle, it's fun. It's just a really, really good time for all, for everyone. Um, and that's kind of a way that we connect with our um, family. And we do get a lot of support because we are a county. Um, we're a county at start. Um, so we get a lot of funding from uh, different avenues. So, you know, the federal government, but we also get it from the county. We also get it from the local government and then other different grants in between. So um, that's some of the ways that we could help with um, connecting with families, um, you know, just checking in too, you know, uh, I mean, you know, if you haven't seen a child for a while, um, you know, it's always a good idea. I know with a lot of child care centers, 
um it might be a little bit different to actually connect with the family via email i know a lot of you guys have uh, different apps like tadpole um different things to that extent to uh, uh connect with families sometimes just a phone call to check in and see how they're doing um might go a long long way um with connecting with them um sorry i'm mumbling on again uh, Ms. Clark, do you have anything to add regarding connecting with families and communities? Uh, I think you came in um, during the uh, case study when I was reading it. Do um, you have anything to add? Um, so in my program, like, um, different because um, I work with people this. So um, it's just very this way. We do email. We have the Apple program where I email my parents and they can text me and get us to my phone. Um, we are, pro our, it's a school district, so we have different funding. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just a private funding, but we get a lot of grants and different things of that nature as well. Yes. Um, do you, how do you guys promote? Um, do you guys have any like special classes that you do or anything um, to help the families better themselves? Basically, the case study was about a uh, single mom. Um, basically, the college uh, professor uh, helped um, have a support for the. Uh, single mom um, when she was in class. Um, do you have anything um, to add as far as? So like we have, yes, um, we have a three-year-old, we just got home. <laughs> no worries. Sorry, so we have um, a thing called ESCO. And so, like for families that's like low income or single family homes, or single fathers, we have a have a donation box, and they provide like clothing, shoes, supplies once a week. Home, home like a little bag of food, like um ravioli cups, or macaroni cups, or fruit cups, things of that nature. And then we have like a support group for mothers, for single parents. So we give them resources, just talk to us about how they're feeling. Um, do we just give them just resources and help them cope with single parents? Wait a second, please. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, so we just provide a lot of different things for our parents. We have um, PTA night. So we have this moment to provide free childcare so they'll be able to enjoy you know, what we have going on here. A lot of things we do. I work for a school district, so as you can imagine, we do a lot. Sure, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, Kayla, can you hear? Sorry, I know that you said that you, you oh, I was, we're breaking up. I don't know if you could hear better or not. Yeah, it was just uh, Aisha was talking and like, breaking up a lot. Oh, so I just okay. wanted to make sure that I was being able to understand what she was sharing. Oh, did did you understand what she was sharing? What I understood is that her program provides a lot of resources to families that are in need. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, and there's a lot of different things that they do with, uh, um, she even mentioned like even single mothers um, getting food. Um, and yeah, there's it, there's a lot. Well, there's um, things that we do just have for single family homes. We do things for two family homes, so you know, for everybody. But we try to service everyone. Mm. And the way we, everyone can feel welcome. We have after school programs for kids need help with tutoring, um, just like emotional support. During the day I work in class, you know I'm a site coordinator. 
I work in some of the classrooms with some of the kids that suffer from emotional, emotional language development. So I go in and do different activities with them, find skills. There's a lot of different things that I do as well to help out with kids. And I, Aisha, do do you all you you said you also do um you also have parent night, which it helps uh, a lot with the parents possibly going out and enjoying their company. We do like so the school year. We will have a parent night like once a month. We like and with the parents, so we'll go to like a local winery and where the mothers can get together and have wine and just talk about different things. Just get mothers out and let them have a break. Um, we'll have, it's, I'm here in Chicago, so it's still kind of cold, so we're still trying to plan for next month in May. We'll do movie night in the park at our school. Um, we have ice cream sandwiches, we do cake walks, we do a lot of different things. And then a lot of things that we have for parents just to come out and do on their own. Meet and greet, that way they can come home with another and set up play dates and things like that. Just for other parents in different classrooms to get to know each other. Instead of just your one kindergarten class or your one first grade class. Our first grade class has four different classes. So it's kind of just all the parents to mingle and just know each other. And Get a feel of different cultures and things like that. Perfect. Um, did you catch all that, Kayla? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, it was a little hard to hear. Um, you were breaking up a little bit, but um, I did catch. We caught most of what you were saying. Um, so thank you for sharing, ladies. Um, so yeah, just connecting with families and computers, there's a lot of things that um, schools, um, child care centers, preschools, um, head starts, there's just a lot of things and a lot of avenues that um, you could do to connect with um, your community and to help uh, families that are in need. Um, so yeah, uh, that really concludes, um, you kind of came at the end. Uh, uh, Ms. Clark, um, at the end of the uh, live session, um, but do you guys have any questions, answers um, regarding the live session? Um, I will also view. Uh, I will also view this recording um, tomorrow, um, so you guys have a chance to review the important dates. Uh, and the different things that were covered as well. Okay, so. Um, sorry, what did you say? I said sound. Thank you. Um, so, if you guys don't have any questions, um, here you're seeing any questions. Uh, uh, feel free if you if a question does come up. Um, it was a pleasure having you guys in class. Um, just make sure that you guys look at the due dates because they are fast approaching. You guys do have a big week this week of getting assignments in. Um, so thank you guys and we will talk soon. Thank you. Thank you.